Good morning. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, and I'm delighted to be here from Washington, D.C., where people say that is the city where your dreams go to die. Um, <laughs> and that's because at the national level, when we do policy, it gets reduced to the lowest common denominator, so you just don't recognize your dream anymore when it finally comes out to us in policy. But it's wonderful to me to be, for me to be here today to be a part of this very important conference. It's always a pleasure for me to be back here in Western New York because it does hold many fond memories for me. My youngest brother and his wife graduated from Brockport and both have had very successful careers and raised a wonderful family as a result of their educational experiences here at the college. So I used to run up and down the freeway from Buffalo to Brockport sometimes, dropping him off on weekends when he'd come home to get his laundry done. I'm impressed by your commitment to diversity. You have an assistant provost who has been a wonderful host to me, and her role is very important um, at this college because she leads your diversity efforts. Susan, thank you so much for everything. You also have a college-wide diversity committee and a grant program that supports programs and events that promote dialogue and enhance understanding of diversity in many contexts, like the Afro-Cuban dance and drum workshop you hosted this past weekend. I also want to applaud you and President Halstead for your continued commitment. He and I have spoken about today's conference, and I want you to know he's very proud of the college's hard work to make this event a success. And as you've heard, he regrets that he can't be here. But I, he and I agreed that it was very important for him to attend the first meeting for SUNY campus leaders. Both John and Kathy are actively engaged in ASKU, and we benefit from their leadership and Brockport's accomplishments. And so, Kathy, I want to thank you for being here this morning. I also want to applaud you for the breadth of the content in this year's conference, Building Community Through Diversity, Championing Access and Equity. You know, building community is not easy, and we live in a very mobile society, and one in which it seems people are more attached to their earbuds and headsets than to person-to-person -person interaction. Back in the year 2000, Robert Putnam wrote Bowling Alone, which was a book about the collapse and revival of American community. In it, he describes how in-person social interaction has declined since the 1950s and discusses the isolation that has occurred and its detrimental effect on community building and citizenship. Those of you of my generation likely remember neighborhoods with houses that featured a big front porch. People actually sat on those porches with no earbuds or headphones, and they greeted their neighbors who stopped in and others who maybe strolled by. But today, it's not uncommon for neighbors to be strangers. Today's isolation can be attributed to a number of things. One, we have technology, where seemingly more prevalent philosophy of meism, or just the busy and often frenetic lives that we now lead. We know, though, that to have a healthy, vital, and successful society, a sense of community, is a must. And so we need a sense of identity, a sense of pride in who we are and where we live and in what we do, which is why so many of you have spent the last few weeks trying to ensure that freshmen and new faculty and staff have received a hearty welcome to the Brockport campus. When people feel disconnected from community, they don't feel responsible for what happens within that community. Common goals and common experiences bring people and communities closer and help them share an authentic experience of what it means to be a part of a community. As educators who understand the value of community, we have an additional challenge and it goes beyond a nostalgic yearning for that big front porch. We must remember that we are educating 21st 
century students. They will be citizens of a global community, a world connected by technology that is economically, socially, and yes, politically interdependent. In one of your statement of principles, you say that diversity at the College of Brockport is anchored in our mission to make student success our highest priority, and that the college is committed to providing opportunities for students to see themselves as citizens of a culturally diverse society and a globally interdependent community and foster a lifelong civic engagement. So clearly, your campus gets it. And so leadership for building community through access and diversity must come from throughout the university, and it must include intentional change and be solutions oriented. That's why I'm so impressed with your holistic approach to diversity. As I travel across the country, I think you would be very surprised at how many campuses are striving to be like you and have your success. I also want to quote a few lines from your guiding principles of diversity. Not that you don't have them memorized, but I think they deserve being emphasized. As members of the College of Brockport, you say, we value human diversity because it enriches our lives and is fundamental to the college's commitment in teaching, learning, scholarship, and service leading to student success. So student success is the focus, and that is the goal for this community, and it is also the goal for all of our Ask You members. Access and inclusion is one of our values as an association. We advocate for accessible, affordable, quality public higher education, and we support our members' historic mission of serving students who are non-traditional and represent diverse backgrounds. Ed educational opportunity is a value that holds great meaning for me personally. You see, before my parents relocated to New York City, I spent my early years in a tiny town in rural North Carolina. And there I spent a lot of time with my grandmother working, and I do mean working, on our family farm. During those days, my grandmother taught me a lot, and not just about doing chores and gathering eggs. You see, she was the granddaughter of slaves, but she lived to see her granddaughter and her grandsons go to college. So my grandmother's life helped me to understand the overwhelmingly important role education can play in young people's lives. Education can literally transform lives. I know it did for my brothers and me. And that's why I know how vitally important it is that each qualified young person or older person has the opportunity to go to college. It is equally important that they have the opportunity to become engaged in the kind of programs and relationships made possible by your college's commitment to access and diversity. And we had a wonderful conversation about that at dinner last night with several of your colleagues. And it was interesting to see how they really grasped the concept that there has to be engagement. In recent years, we have seen numerous reports claiming that the nation's most elite institutions are dedicated to access. I've even read reports that claim to prove that such institutions provide greater opportunity than places like the College of Brockport. But we know that's false. Researchers at Georgetown University found that at the most competitive colleges, only 14% of students come from the lower 50% of families by income. What's worse, that percentage has not budged for more than 20 years. At institutions where the ability to pay is taken into consideration for admission, that figure is even higher. This suggests, I'm sorry, lower. This suggests that if two qualified candidates were considered for admission, 
the students with less money would be denied. And some of these institutions, as we know, have endowments that run into the billions of dollars. Still, they do very little to educate, advance, and provide opportunity for the lower 50% of the nation's economic stratum. In fact, there is little correlation between a university's wealth and the number of students who receive Pell Grants. Askew institutions serve more than one half of the minority students attending public four-year institutions in this country. Of our nearly 420 institutional and system members, 62 have minority students comprising at least half of their student population. So the college at Brockport's commitment to access and diversity comes at a time when higher education is more important than ever to social advancement, economic security, and even national stability. You should not dismiss that fact lightly. In fact, you should be congratulated and applauded for the work that you do here. When I testified before Congress last year on behalf of the DREAM Act, I told them that approximately 65 undocumented high school seniors had walked across the stage accepting their diplomas and had dreams of pursuing their college education and beginning a career, but that they have few options to pursue these ambitions. Yet the country will need more than one million teachers in the next decade to meet the challenging demands in P through 12 classrooms and hundreds of thousands of nurses to staff high need, high demand hospitals and clinics. In addition, our universities are striving to graduate more engineers and scientists to sustain our knowledge-based economy. Enacting this legislation would further boost efforts to achieve the national goal of increasing the number of college graduates. By passing the DREAM Act, these students would have had an opportunity to contribute to the American economy in high-need disciplines and become capable and contributing citizens to the nation's economy and workforce. I reminded them that ASCU institutions are eager to serve these students and to support them in fulfilling their ambitions. Obviously, the DREAM Act has not become a reality, but we're still working on it. And I want to remind each of you that you are private citizens in this country, and that it is very important for you to write your local Congress leaders when important bills are before us that contribute to the important functioning of our society for the future. So I hope you will do that. Then this summer, after the Supreme Court decision in Fisher versus University of Texas, ASCU and approximately 40 other higher education associations ran an ad in the New York Times to reconfirm our commitment to the principles of diversity. We noted that the decision to leave intact the long-standing legal principle that the educational benefits of a widely diverse student body are a compelling governmental interest. We ran this ad because we all were holding our breath as to how the Supreme Court was going to come out on that issue. So we further said that a diverse student body enables all students to have the transformational experience of interacting with their peers who have varied perspectives and come from different backgrounds. And we pointed out that these experiences, which are highly valued by employers because of their importance in the workplace, also prepare students with the skills they need to live in an interconnected world and to be more engaged citizens. Our economic future, democracy, and global standing will suffer if the next generation is not ready to engage and work with people whose background and experiences and perspectives are different from their own. I believe your students already understand that if they are to be successful leaders, they will have to be able to supervise and engage colleagues from varied backgrounds. 
Now, for many of you, this argument is undoubtedly seems self-evident. But unfortunately, we all still have segments of our society who need convincing. If we look at the advantages of diversity from a purely pragmatic standpoint, we know the following. Diversity stimulates economic growth. According to economist and author Felipe Legrand, diversity boosts innovation, and innovation is the source of the most economic growth. He points out that most innovations today come not from individuals, but from groups of talented people sparking off of each other, and that those with different ideas, different perspectives, and experiences add something extra to the mix. As an example, he cites that many of the big names of the internet revolution were co-founded by immigrants. Diversity also produces culturally vibrant communities. A study from the University of Pennsylvania sponsored by a Ricker Life Campaign, a program of the National Fair Housing Alliance, found that diverse neighborhoods furnish a large part of the audience and supports regional and community cultural institutions and that diverse neighborhoods with high levels of cultural engagement are often the engine of economic revitalization for urban communities. Third, we know that diverse schools enrich the lives of all students and prepare them to be successful in a multicultural world. Diversity Digest, a publication of the American Association of Colleges and Universities, released an article entitled who benefits from racial diversity in higher education? According to the article, the opportunity to socialize with someone of a different racial group or discussing racial issues contributes to the student's academic development, satisfaction with college, level of cultural awareness, and commitment to promoting racial understanding. So pragmatically, then building communities through diversity is sound practice. But we need to overcome lingering prejudices and having an African American as President of the United States has elevated this issue in positive and sometimes frightening ways. The 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Movement has also reminded us of how far we have come but that there is still much more work to be done. Throughout my career, I'm often asked about being the first African American and or the first woman to have held positions of leadership. More specifically, I am asked, how difficult has it been and what is my perspective? Well, I would not be telling the truth if I did not say that there have been good times and bad times. Having been born into segregation, I still remember the humiliation of having to have to drink from the colored water fountain. On the other hand, I am grateful that my family did not allow me to internalize hate and prejudice and that I was prepared by them and my educational experiences to face challenges and barriers as puzzles and problems that would test my courage and spur my intellectual curiosity. As far as my perspective, I hope I am part of what I call the last generation of firsts. Hence, I believe I will see a woman inaugurated as President of the United States in my lifetime. Because almost every utterance we hear about women and equality still carries the line, women have come a long way, but not far enough. And I have to agree with the former Secretary of State when she says that empowering women is a core imperative if the United States is to endure economic success and remain a global leader. This annual conference clearly demonstrates that access and equity and community building reaches far beyond compliance and regulations that you are prepared to be champions. So how can I encourage you to invite more success and to strengthen your work in the Brockport community as we advance into the 21st century? 
First, I encourage you to be mindful that if Americans are to have equal access to this university and others and the workforce, we still have to help schools ensure equal opportunity and to close achievement gaps between race and ethnic groups. ASCQ is deeply involved in helping states, including New York, to implement the Common Core Standards so that students are better prepared for college and future careers. And of course, Brockport has a long history of doing this work. The United States is facing a new diversity in that its current minorities are fast becoming the majority. In the year 2000, White people accounted for about 71% of the population, but by 2050, that number will drop to 53% or lower. If we look at the current census data, the average African American woman is 25 years of age. The average Hispanic woman is 21 years of age. The average white woman is 41 years of age. So in 2012, just a year ago in June, the Hispanic Latino high school graduating class surpassed the total number of whites graduating, which means our colleges and universities must double down on its efforts to prepare and graduate a more diverse student body. Last fall, ASCU and its members, including your college, made a very public commitment to this effort through project degree completion. They pledged to help increase the number of undergraduate baccalaureate degrees by 3.8 million by 2005, while striving to provide these students with a quality education and upholding the principles of student access, diversity, and success. We have had 500 colleges and universities to sign up and participate in this project. We also spearheaded a published study several years ago that looked at 12 public colleges and universities with significant student success in preparing and graduating students. The study found several characteristics common among these campuses. First, a campus culture that believes all students can succeed and that they should be held to high expectations plus a genuine commitment by the entire institutions will help students to succeed. Those campuses that demonstrate the most success and what was most universally striking about this study is that they were genuine and that they demonstrated commitment by faculty who both expressed and acted on the conviction that an important part of their role was to help students succeed. They didn't leave it up to the students. And it's interesting now because as we prepare for our national work in Washington this year, one of the tenets that, as you know, the President of the United States has put forward is, is that we look at the notion of rewarding colleges and universities who do do this kind of work, who commit to students and who graduate students, that these institutions would receive more federal dollars than other institutions. Institutions that create a sense of belonging were on that list. By that we mean there should be an emphasis on encouraging students to be involved in the campus community. This encouragement should come from faculty, staff, administration. And belonging to a campus means that you are sharing language like family, student-centered, culture of concern, and caring. That is how you would talk about your campus community to reinforce a sense of belonging. Third, purpose and place is important. And so while all colleges and universities have a mission statement, it is the values component of such a statement that affects student success. And I read some of your statements earlier, and yours is one of the strongest that I have seen as I visit colleges and universities around the country. And one of the in the study, one of the campuses were excited, excited because their student model was students first. 
And when I visited that campus, every place you went, everyone talked about students first. This institution also hired, supported, rewarded faculty and staff who had this commitment in mind. Integration and alignment of student success is another important tenet. This provides for better coordination and convenience for students. And campuses approach this in different ways, whether they collaborate or whether they put everyone in the same building, regardless of the administrative alignment, they set up a system and a culture that says our students will be supported. And undergirding all these characteristics and tenets is a need for a collective vision that is articulated and supported by the college's leadership. The vision should be created by the campus community with the focus on what the community as a group wants to see happen in support of students and helping them. And campuses also go back and refresh their vision about every five years or so if they are successful. So we know there's no magic bullet that guarantees student success. It requires understanding your campus culture, aligning people and programs, and making a long-term collective commitment to students. From what I know about Brockport, you have the ingredients in place to succeed. But there is one last characteristic and tenet that I want to remind you about, and that is the importance of listening to the voices of others and acknowledging their experiences and their history. And so I want to share with you one of the earliest diversity stories I learned. You've all heard it before. It meant a great deal to me as a child. This is a historic story of an oppressed people who left their homes, crossed the Atlantic Ocean, and found themselves as strangers in a strange land. Some did not survive the voyage. In America, they found themselves at the mercy of a people from another race and culture. They were frightened. They did not speak the language of the land. They did not share its religion. And the life they lived on the American continent was very hard. Now, as you have all probably guessed, I want to tell you the story of the pilgrims and the first Thanksgiving. Now, I know some of you might have been expecting a different story, but back in 1620, a group of 152 English Protestants, men, women, and children, took a 67-day voyage across the Atlantic in a small commercial vessel called the Mayflower. They intended to settle in the colony of Virginia, but a slight miscalculation took them to Cape Cod, Massachusetts, on the verge of winter. These pilgrims had chosen to immigrate to America because, they said, the vast and unpeopled countries of America were fruitful and fit for habitation. Now, we know that America was certainly vast and fit for habitation, but it was far from uninhabited and lucky for the pilgrims. These English settlers were ill-prepared for the life in New England, ignorant of the native flora and fauna, unaware of natural medicines, the pilgrims quickly began to go hungry and fall ill. By spring, nearly half of the original group was dead. The Wabanak people of Cape Cod did not greet the Mayflower, but they were acutely aware of its arrival. All winter, they spied on the new settlers from afar, and they could hardly believe what they saw. How could these Europeans be hungry? Well, divine providence had dropped them down in the midst of great abundance. As the pilgrims ascended the shores of Cape Cod, they literally trampled on hordes of oysters and clams underfoot. But they did not realize that even lobster was edible. Being terrified of the New England forests, they overlooked the bounty around them. Well, by spring, the native people realized they had a problem on their hands. It was obvious that the helpless Europeans were not planning to leave. The Indians feared that the pilgrims were likely to resort to something desperate, 
After all, they were concerned that, of the fact that these white folks did have guns. So in March of 1621, three months after the Pilgrims arrived in what is now known as Plymouth, Massachusetts, a tall Native American man boldly walked into the modest settlement and called out, welcome Englishmen, in English. The Pilgrims were started to startle, to say the least. This was the first Native American they had met, and he spoke English. This man told the Pilgrims his name was Somerset, he was far more worldly and sophisticated than they had expected. In fact, he had been to England. He told the pilgrims how he and a group of his comrades had once been kidnapped by an English captain who intended to sell them into slavery. The ignorant pilgrims benefited from the sophistication of the Wampanoag tribe. The seed that they had brought from Europe would not grow in the sandy New England soil. But the Native Americans taught them how to find herring and use it as a fertilizer when planting. Such Native American crops as corn, pumpkins, and beans. They taught them how to find clams and eels and where to find nuts and berries and how to hunt for deer, turkey, and bear. In fact, the Native Americans saved their lives. Now these are the true events leading up to the first Thanksgiving. And so I tell this story as a kind of parable. Certainly, culture diversity has its benefits. And the English and the Wampanoag lived in harmony for nearly 50 years. That's beyond the lifetime of all the guests at the original Thanksgiving. So as you can see, the story demonstrates that the history of culture diversity is entirely colored by the person telling it. And so I encourage you to listen to the voices of your students, to the voices of your colleagues, and those in your community, so that together we can create a seamless and welcoming community for our 21st students. Thank you, and congratulations on holding this wonderful conference.